Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. And for those of you joining online, um, we're really, really pleased to be bringing you our most recent edition of Relative Insights Spotlight Series live from the Sambar rooftop in Manhattan. So that's extremely exciting. So um, first things first, before we get going, I'm just going to explain what we've got in store for you over the next hour. Um, we're going to be whizzing through um, our, our new report, which is the Psychedelics Report, which is extremely exciting. So I'm going to be taking you through that. Um, and then I'm going to be handing over to, to my colleague Maddie and our wonderful panelists who are going to be talking all things text analytics. So without further ado, let's get into the, the presentation. So. Um, just before we fly into the most recent work that we've done on psychedelics, I just want to give you a quick recap on Relative Insight for those of you that are unaware of what it is that we do. So Relative, we're a text analytics company. Um, so what that means is that we help our customers analyze and visualize text data. Um, so we'll get into exactly what that means in a bit more detail. But what's quite interesting about us is that we come from a fairly unusual background in that we started out life um, catching bad guys online. And the way that we did that was through comparison. Um, so by comparing uh, conversations of children online, individual children, we were able to identify unique differences between individuals. Um, and um, by identifying those differences, we were able to see actually when someone wasn't a child but was actually a, a masquerading adult. Um, so really interesting backstory. Now, um, over the last five or so years, we've been using that same comparative methodology to apply to some, some main business cases. So it typically gets applied in three different ways. The first is digital marketing. So using text analytics to inform wonderful marketing strategies and positioning brand pieces, et cetera. The second type of work that we tend to do is around understanding consumers, um, understanding trends and audiences. And then the final one is over in customer experience. So the wonderful data, the amazing and rich information that customer contact centers and uh, anyone working in customer service, all that information that, that throws up, a lot of which is language, um, we're able to do some really, really cool um, insights work using that data. So um, I mentioned that we are a text analytics company. Now, I think for people that spend their entire working days doing that, that's pretty obvious to most of us. However, I think that it's pretty important that we don't assume that everyone knows what that means. And so when, I, when we talk about text data, ultimately we mean words or language. Um, and these are the kind of the four main hero data sources that our customers tend to succeed analyzing. And they spend a lot of their time analyzing these types of data. So let me whiz you through them. So the first is survey data. So if you think about surveys, fairly ubiquitous. Most people are doing surveys. I think you would all agree with that statement. The problem is that people are, tend to be hamstrung by, by the open-ended element of, of surveys because if they choose to include an open end in their survey, there are a couple of outcomes. Firstly, they get ignored because analyzing them is a total pain in the ass. Or um, so, some poor person has to then read through the verbatim responses and try and glean some form of idea, some, 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 some form of theme. And those are are pretty underwhelming ways to treat language. And so actually what we find is that we speak to customers that tend not to put open-ended responses in their surveys because they're so problematic. And then with the power of relative insight alongside their survey platform, they're then able to chuck in loads of open ends. And that's ultimately what we're going to be demonstrating today. Uh, so that it, it, it happens to be that the topic is psychedelics, but uh, I think the thing that we're demonstrating is that the amazing work you can do with open-ended language. The second thing is social data, and this tends to be social listening tools. So I think, again, something that's um, part of most marketing insights teams is a social listening tool. It's part of the important toolkit that th those people use in their day to day. And I think that from a quant point of view, social listening tools cannot be criticized in that they are really, really wonderful at capturing quant information around social data. But I think if, if you're intending to do a little bit more sophisticated text analytics, then Relative Insight can be a wonderful partner to stick in alongside your social listening tool of choice. Review data. I think that we would, we would say that review data tends to be the, probably the biggest and most untapped source of consumer and brand and, and uh, product information. If you think about Amazon, Google, Trustpilot, TripAdvisor, you can keep going through those amazing sources of information. And then finally, those customer contact center, customer contact team data sources, 
um, which again are really, really wonderful for comparative insights. So hopefully that brings everyone up to speed on what on earth I meant by text analytics, right? So hopefully we're all on a, on a level now. And so the message for today is, no, we're not necessarily super enthusiastic psychedelic drug takers over at Relative Insight. We may be, but I'm not saying that we are or we're not. Um, the thing, the message is that we can analyze and we can organize language from pretty much any topic, any source you can think of. And so I'm sure you're expecting that some of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting is pretty weird and wonderful. And honestly, the, the language in this area is pretty crazy. Um, but with comparative text analytics, we're able to make sense of it quickly. Um, so on to the, uh, some of the insights that we've pulled out. So the first thing to say is that psychedelics is an interesting topic. Um, it's estimated to be worth 10.75 billion in the states alone by 2027. Um, it's currently being talked at, about in Congress around legalities and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely a rising tide. Michael Pollan over on the left, for those of you that have heard of him, if you haven't, he's, his book called How to Change Your Mind is definitely something worth reading, regardless of your views on psychedelics. And Aaron Rodgers, NFL, claimed that his experiences in psychedelics has led to his recent success. Um, so it's definitely a thing, let's put it that way. So on to some of the, some of the things that we found out. Um, so first things first, the two different psychedelics that we chose, the psilocybin, which is a funny word and hard to say, um, but most of you will know that as magic, mu magic mushrooms or mushies, right? that's psilocybin over on the left. And on the right, we've got LSD, which is a synthetic um, psychedelic drug. So what we did was that we looked at um, a great number of people's um, transcribed trip experiences. So this is people talking about their trip experience in a survey, um, and we, we were able to go out to 4,000 global respondents. We analyzed 5 million words, so we're talking about serious, serious amounts of language here. And so the good thing is that the, thing, the insights I'm going to present aren't based on a couple of respondents. They're based on enormous amounts of language, so I think that brings some reliability into it. And the main comparison, so of course you'll all remember that Relative Insight is, is based on comparison, was this difference between magic mushrooms, psilocybin, and LSD. We thought that would be an interesting topic to have a look at. So um, before we delve into the insights, just to give you an idea about some of the verbatim responses that we were looking at, just have a little whiz through these. It's pretty out there. The language is fairly colorful. Um, you'll have to prepare yourself. If you're not into swear words, then this might not be the presentation for you. Um, but the reason I wanted to pop these up there is because a lot of it is quite a mess. And so I think the, the point to take here is a lot, a lot of the time we're, when we're speaking to customers and prospects at Relative, they're saying, well, I work in the pharmaceutical industry or I work in automotive or I work in veterinary science. How on earth can your tool be applicable? And the idea is that through comparison, we can categorize language regardless of what it's about. And so we were able to make sense of this sort of semi-pseudo-madness um, because we're using our methodology. Right, so first thing, um, I wanted to just pop up most used phrases, um, which is quite interesting. Um, some of the stuff that you would expect uh, but you can already see some quite interesting and unusual words, like gyrating, for example. So when you use comparison, if you think about comparison as a methodology, everything that's consistent between people talking about magic mushrooms and people talking about LSD, that's all gone, and you're just left with the differences, right? And that's when you get these wonderful insights like gyrating, because that just isn't something that's going to be used in normal discourse. We... We built a number of different comparisons. So the first one we thought might be interesting would be to look at men versus women. Um, and so what we were able to see at scale is that women were much more emotional about their, ex their, their psychedelic experience. Um, they, they would talk about different emotions they experienced, both positive and, ne and negative, whereas men tended to be understated. And not just understated, they would also diminish the impact of their experience. They would say that it wasn't as strong as they expected, it wasn't as good as they expected, it didn't like turn out how they expected, and then actually later on in their responses, they then um, were a bit more honest. So perhaps as it kind of took hold, <laughs> their experience changed. 
Um, but that was like sort of a very top line experience. The second thing that we, we saw is that women were definitely putting it out there. Like they were very, very confident, extroverted and descriptive around things that they were experiencing. Um, whereas men were much more inward looking, much more insular and also talking about themselves a lot not talking about the things that were happening around them, the people that they were sharing their time with, friends and family, etc. Hope you like the visuals. Um, on to the, uh, the comparison between the two drugs themselves. So when we looked at psilocybin over on the left, people talking about their psilocybin experience would talk about the power of nature. They would also talk about the power of the mushroom itself. And so a lot of the stuff was to do with uh, like flora and fauna. Um, I've put some funny quotes over here to keep it light. And over on the right-hand side, the LSD experience was much more to do with people, to do with shapes and colors, um, and actually the, the, the stuff that was taking place around them at the time. And so this is a little bit kind of so far so obvious perhaps, you know, the kind of hippie power of the mushroom thing. Um, but we were really interested to see the, the distinct differences, even though these two experiences on paper are meant to be the same. Like, they're absolutely not. There are distinct differences. Whizzing on. So magic mushroom trippers, they're just kind of in their own space, having a wonderful relaxing sometimes. That's a word that we saw often coming up and, and sort of personal journey. Whereas the LSD takers would be out there in the world causing havoc, <laughs> causing problems, <laughs> experiencing problems. Um, and so actually the way that people spend their hours whilst on these two different drugs is also really, really different, um, which, was, which was super fascinating to see. There were also some, some sensory differences. And so people that were under the influence of psilocybin talked about smell, and the smells were often linked to natural things. So they would talk about, like this example, is you, you could s smell soil or they could smell grass, or they could smell dew and stuff like that. And whereas LSD, like this feeling of like rushing air, like this is a little bit more akin to kind of just that sort of euphoria feeling. Um, again, so it's quite a distinct difference. The, the final thing that we wanted to pull out here was the physical impacts of psilocybin. Um, so people actually doing things, moving around, whereas much more mental with, with LSD. And so like may not even, it involved the person actually physically moving at all, um, but actually just colors and experiences happening um, in their mind. So I've taken you through some of the highlights of the, of the, uh, the psychedelics report that we've produced. And I think that that's probably quite cool and quite interesting. I think it's possibly something you've not seen presented back to you. You know, if you're in, in, in insights or in marketing, you're probably used to people talking to you about sustainability and wellness and Gen Z and all the stuff that you're, you know, probably fairly worn down with hearing about those topics. So hopefully this has been a unique topic for you to think about. But I think that the question still remains. It's like, so if I work for an agency or a brand, like what on earth do I do with that? And I think that there is an interesting and slightly larger question here, which is, especially in the States um, with, um, with drug legislation changing around certain um, substances, that means that people will just be using those substances at home and they'll be experiencing your content and they'll be interacting with your brands in those states. And there begs a question as to like whether that should be something that brands consider. I think that for these, this particular report that we produced, I think it does speak to some maybe underlying um, patterns that people are experiencing in different demographics and what that means for brands of course and agencies is up to you guys to decide um, but we're really pleased to be able to bring you something fresh and insightful hopefully in this area so before I hand you over to Maddie and our wonderful panel um, I think the the final point I'll leave you with is that text analytics especially powered by comparison can help you uncover things that you didn't know to search for. And those things can actually be truly insightful, although that's a, a definitely a massively overused phrase, so you have to forgive me. Um, and I think that, sure, we've applied this in a slightly flippant way to people's trip experiences, but the idea is that we could apply it to pretty much any topic you could think of. 
So if you're interested in downloading the full report, uh, this is the QR code that you can do that. There's also a banner on your way out with the QR code on it as well. Um, and with that, I'll hand you over to Maddie. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Hi, everyone. Everyone online, if you have any questions, you can submit them um, in the Q&A box on Zoom. And then after we answer the online questions, we will have the audience um, ask any questions they have as well. So I can have the panelists come up. Thanks. You can sit down. Thanks. So as James mentioned, I'm Maddie. I'm an account director here at Relative Insight in the New York office. Um, we have Idil here. She's the SVP of Research and Insights at Odyssey. And Carver Lowe, he's group director at strategy at Sullivan. And we have Rena Plapler as well. She's a strategy partner at Emblem. Wonderful. So just to get us started, um, Adele, can you tell us a little bit more about your role at Odyssey and what your insights process looks like currently? Sure. Oh, this is on. <laughs> um, so I head up the research team at Odyssey, which is the second largest broadcast, uh, radio broadcast, and second largest uh, podcast network in the United States. And part of my charge, is, along with my colleagues, is to build thought leadership platforms to answer the key question, why someone should include audio in their marketing plan, and subsequently, of course, why they should choose Odyssey. So we're constantly thinking of ways of uh, revealing how people consume audio. And our goal is always to break new ground and uncover something that people hadn't even thought about, or we maybe hypothesized, but hadn't quite um, encapsulated. So yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. Carver at Sullivan, can you talk me through a little bit of what you do there? Yeah, so uh, we do uh, what we call work with consequence. And so a lot of that is working with mostly B2B brands that have long, complex sales cycles uh, and really have to put a lot of thought and consideration into any purchase. And so we build brands uh, and then activate them. And, and you know, using language is really important in how you talk about products, messaging, customer journeys. And so um, we really just kind of search for insights uh, from a lot of different sources, uh, customers and uh, clients themselves, and language is really important throughout th that whole process. Wonderful. And what were those industries that you focus on primarily? Um, that's often higher ed, uh, finance, uh, industrials, tech. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the key ones, but um, yeah. Great. And Rena? Sure. Um, I'm a partner at Emblem, and our focus is really about building strong attachments, emotional attachments between brands and people. We base a lot of our thinking on the work of Daniel Kahneman and um, sort of thinkers that talk about we make decisions based on emotion, and so really reframing the entire relationship between brand building and customers and stakeholders. And so we use Relative Insight as well as other tools to really dig deep and understand the bonds we have with the brands we use and love and how to create more distinction and more relevance across any industry, whether it's B2B, B2G, B2C, uh, between brands and their audiences. Thanks, Rena. And can you talk me through a little bit of the industry challenges you've faced in the past before using Relative Insight? Sure. Um, well, some of you may have had these challenges, too, in the B2B space. Uh, you know, there's not a ton of available data, particularly customer language around brands. So we tended to uh, do audits that were more outside in, you know, website analysis and collateral material. Um, and with relative insight, we're able to do that, also add a layer of insight related to comparing the language used on the websites to understand both content, tone, tenor, semiotics. Um, as well as social media, and in other cases, things you mentioned, uh, more you know, customer-facing communications, whether it's reviews, social, um, or surveys as well. Do you have similar challenges, Carver? Or? Yeah, I think you really talk to a lot of, especially what clients are interested in, is so much of our work when we're doing things like audits, desk research, um, because you have to infer 
Um, you're not going to get directly, if you're looking at competitors, what they're you know, thinking, feeling, how their decision-making process is. Um, being able to add something like Relative Insight can provide a level of statistical rigor where normally, you know, especially even 10 years ago, you don't really have that um, or the capacity to do that in any scalable way. Um, and I think it helps reinforce a lot of ideas. Um, it helps clients feel more confident about the recommendations you're making. Um, and, you know, it just really helps solidify, you know, something that you may feel anecdotally, but um, you can't prove out very easily. Yeah, absolutely. And Adele, same question. Um, I think we loved using Relative Insights and its methodology for um, helping us frame hypotheses better and also prepare other research tools. So the way you measure is going to define largely what you find. And before, we were very cognizant of you know, not proceeding in a major project with just a sample of a few like-minded people. So we turned to Relative Insights um, to just cast a very broad net um, of language, of online conversations, to see if our hypotheses were even there, and, and to get ideas as to what should be um, drafted for a, perhaps a, a more quantitative study. Great. Great. And Carver, I know we talked a little bit about some of the challenges with daunting data. We talk text data all day long. So can you talk me through a little bit about some of those daunting tasks that you have with large amounts of data? Yeah, um, you really hear, I mean, when you think about customer sites, it can be really vast. Um, when you're looking at customer responses, it can be really vast. And I think the challenge is not to get hung up on something that's too anecdotal. And so one of the ways we think about using the data is bottom up. It's sort of like you were talking about with your hypotheses is um, you may have an idea and you really want to vet it out. So uh, you take a look and you see, OK, I have a feeling that this might be the case, that, that these ideas are relevant or are not being talked about even. Uh, we did with one of our clients. Um, and it lets you kind of prove out that hypothesis uh, in a way that you wouldn't maybe be able to do without a lot of manual labor. Um, and I, I think that's, that's really important. And I also like to hear about how you use it in the same way as sort of different stages of a project, not just as like an output, but even just as a very initial sort of gut check. Adele, are you able to? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'll give you one example. This is so close to mind now because we just launched this platform about audio rituals. So at the end of every year, we sort of say, OK, what are we going to research and talk about next year that's not going to be just uh, fulfilling our own intellectual curiosity, but also help um, answer some questions from the broader media industry. And one idea we had was just how ritualistic audio might be and how we bring audio into day-to-day -day rituals. You know, There were discussions around, you know, oh, how we listen to um, music before a sports event or how we uh, make sure we go for a run when our new podcast episode drops. But these were more anecdotal um, conversations. So we turned to Relative Insights just to define what audio-related rituals might be. And we were just hoping for a long list that we could then take into a survey. And I distinctly remember our analyst um, reaching back out saying, you know, here is what we're seeing. People are DJing throughout the day. They're using audio and platforms like um, um, from a mobile device to a desktop to a uh, radio in the car. They're going in and out, and they're varying their content. OK, that's good. Um, and then she said, and in some instances, audio is the ritual in itself. And that was the di discovery. Oh, how so? Um, so that's so audio is known as the companion medium, generally speaking. So it's something you put in the background and you're able to multitask and say you're listening to some music or you're listening to the news and you're about to carry on with um, something you're doing in the kitchen or an errand, et cetera, companion medium. And that's an opportunity for brands to come in to that moment. What we saw was that people were arranging their day around audio. So the content had moved from background to the foreground, and they were um, prioritizing that listening experience and then bringing the activity in. So um, some quotes we got from the research um, showed that oh, people were going on runs, and if they forgot their um, earbuds, the run was shorter because audio didn't carry them through. And they were going on the run to make sure they listened to that particular episode of a podcast. 
and telling everybody else to sort of um, give them that time. So it's really appointment listening. And we then use that to um, plug into a survey, and we found out that 40% of people, an enormous number of people in the United States, arrange their day around audio events like this. Wow. And was the type of audio changing, or did that stay consistent? It changes. It, it's used news. Another thing that came out of the Relative Insights uh, work was that, oh, news is like a bookend. You know, you start in the morning, and then you check in again before you end your day. Um, music go and different genres of music go in and out, but it, um, and podcasts were around the clock depending on what you wanted to grow with, or it could be self-improvement, it could be just your happiness, or it could be, you know, more financial savvy. So people really picked curated content depending on um, what they were interested in and what they were very much intentional about. That's fascinating. That's yeah, it started with relative insights. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it, love it. Awesome. Well, I think that was a good transition into my next question was um, just talking through some of the project work that you've done that you found very fascinating. Um, so, Rena, we can start with you on the brand intimacy study. Sure. Um, we've actually taken our relationship with Relative Insight um, in an interesting direction, which is that um, Emblem does an annual study measuring the emotional impact of brands. And we partnered with Relative Insight um, using artificial intelligence and text data. So we analyzed over 1.5 billion words um, on over 600 brands. And combining our methodology with theirs, looked at how people are expressing the emotional connections they have with brands across Twitter in this case. And so um, besides an enormous undertaking, um, it's also really interesting because all words have meaning, but trying to sort of boil the differences between Tesla and Toyota or iTunes and Pandora, or we looked at 19 industries. So really trying to sort of see both what are industry um, emotions that people have. Obviously, financial services would be very different than food, um, as well as brands within the category. And so um, besides an enormous undertaking just by the volume, and my team here was helping uh, synthesize that data, what's so interesting is that it let us look at brands over 10 months. So it wasn't a quant survey that you know people answered in 20 minutes at one date and one point and depending on their mood or you know their appetite for answering questions this was looking at a volume of data that would have been impossible and kind of combing through the nuggets that you were mentioning trying to understand that on a brand level so it was awesome yeah and can you share one of the little nuggets you found within the data Sure, I mentioned this um, before, and it sort of aligns to what you were saying. One of the things we found out about YouTube is that people use it to go to sleep, um, which was interesting, whether it's, and I see some head nods, so maybe <laughs> you do that as well, but whether it was music or a, you know, a, a topic, but just something to help people go to sleep, and so that idea of sleep, eat, YouTube, repeat, you know, that sort of tweet came up quite a bit, and that was an interesting insight on both behavior and the way people hold it so close to them as this kind of thing they really value in their life. Yeah, it ties into the rituals right. as well. Amazing. Carver, over to you. Can you talk a little bit about some project work that you've done? Yeah, so uh, one project we worked on as a client was very interested in trying to promote greater innovation internally among employees. And notoriously, even when you're working on your own company, um, it can be hard to get a true sense of sentiment. And then you look at other companies, it's almost impossible. It's like, you know, you see into a black box. Nobody talks about, you know, you can't get access to, you know, their internal message boards or their communications. Um, but one place we did look, and uh, mentioned in the, in the you know, first readout was uh, customer or, I guess, employee reviews. And so we went to Glassdoor and actually isolated out uh, any reviews that mention innovation, um, technology and things like that at different companies, and then parse those through Relative Insight to try and figure out, you know, are there differences in how each of these companies, um, you know, talk about their work? And, you know, it can be tough to look at reviews because you also have tons of biases. People are in there, you know, to vent their frustrations, things that are just noise. Um, but what we found was really interesting was um, there were pretty distinct ways that each of the companies did talk about that, and we got to see some of the language. Uh, and one of the most interesting ones was, you know, you always associate innovation with collaboration, right? It's kind of like this tech mindset. Um, but one of the companies was actually uh, almost antithetical to that, where they were very innovative, um, but they talked a lot about silos and kind of working in a vacuum and kind of 
that the teams weren't collaborative, but they're still seen as a pretty innovative company. Um, and so we're able to parse out that they were really, you know, where they're more innovative is on the product side, really process. And that kind of gave us another lens to bring back to the client and say, you know, here's another way that you can consider, you know, promoting your own innovation that might be more true to you um, as opposed to kind of taking this more top down one view on innovation that we see mostly with tech companies today. Yeah, that's fascinating. And what has your client done with that information? Uh, they have been working hard to build a new innovation team and are kind of basically waiting to for that team to progress a little bit more and then they're going to start to launch it internally and try to promote more of that mindset across the company. Great, fabulous. And yeah, Adil, we, we love what we call here Relative Insight at Stage 5, so just wrapping up a little bit of how you action those findings. I know you mentioned you launched a survey with some of the primary research you did, but anything else you can talk us through a little bit? I mean, it became the headline of the new thought leadership platform, Audio is the Ritual, um, Audio Rituals. So it also helped us um, build stories around you know, these seemingly mundane activities and just how important they were um, in terms of engagement in the activity, in hearing about brands. You know, people were more likely to resonate with a brand and recall a brand's message if the brand is able to join that ritual in a meaningful, um, contextual way. So we were able to also show a path of authenticity to our clients to come in into those moments, enjoy more touch points with customers. So it has a lot of commercial implications too. It's easy enough to tell a brand you have to be more authentic or be authentic and then you know it's a tall order for creative. Um, so how do you exactly do that? And then telling a planner, a media planner, oh, you have to plan based on um, not just who, age and gender, but also think about their habits, their psychographic profile. Um, and here is how. Here is the exact moment. Here is what they're listening. Here is what they're talking about, being more specific about that. So we were able to tell a complete story and um, with additional research and also pinpoint um, important details both to our clients and to our agency partners. Wow, that's amazing. And Rena, lastly, over to you. So the brand intimacy study, what, what do you do with the study? What's, what's kind of the stage five here? Um, we basically promote it each year because it's an annual study. We look at indus industry specifics um, and use it as a tool both as sort of a data warehouse for us, so any pitches or category work, we sort of look at what we found. Um, we use it also as a way to do thought leadership besides the study itself. We write articles on you know, brands in particular on the category. Um, we speak about it at industry events and so forth. And you know, it really becomes a part of our agency kind of IP. And you know, what's interesting too is you know, a lot of what you guys said, I, I sort of relate to as well, because ritual is one of our brand intimacy archetypes. And so that is one of the things that we look at with brands. And the idea of, you know, looking at both uh, sort of anecdotal and big picture is usually where we find the sort of magic. What's the outlying kind of quirkiness and what's the general sentiment? And I think that gives us insight into not just the emotional connections, but you know, the way in which people speak about brands. And it's interesting to translate back to the brand owners who don't necessarily uh, take advantage of, of linking to that kind of uh, sentiment as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when, when can we all see the next brand intimacy study? <laughs> well, you know we've delayed it for yeah. a quarter. So um, we, uh, we should be, you know, in market in 2023. And I think uh, we're just gearing up. It's so overwhelming, and it puts all of our client work on kind of a teeter-totter. So we're looking for a sort of low. Um, and we may try to rein back, like, the 600 brands was just a lot. Um, and also Lots understanding, yeah, the global implications, since Twitter is global but not necessarily strong in every part of the world, kind of figuring out the best way to match its audience with the brands we're looking at. But you'll be hearing from us. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. And Carver, what's next? Can you talk us through a little bit of some upcoming project work? Or Yeah, so uh, we're working on a number of new branding assignments, new messaging assignments with clients, and it's, it's become 
I would say a pretty critical part of the in input process, especially if um, clients have survey data from employees, um, really parsing that out and, and trying to incorporate more into um, you know, more of the standard assignments we do. Great, and Bill, last question. Anything we can keep our eyes out from Odyssey coming up soon? We're gonna be talking more about audio rituals. We're gonna talk about um, growth seekers among audiences. Um, something else that came up from the research is just how intentional and lean forward um, our audiences are and how curious they are when they're curating their content. So um, please look out for that. Will do, will do. Well, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. I think we have some time for questions in the audience. Um, so let me just pull up my phone here. They've been Slack to me. So let's see. Do I have phones? In my pocket. Deep pocket. Here. Question for James, if you want to come back to the front. Uh, in regards to psilocybin trips, focusing more on nature versus LSD trips, focusing more on people, do we think there may be a bias among users? It, 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 it's still quite weird that I'm talking about LSD and psilocybin at work. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I, I think that, yes, there definitely is some form of bias because people have inherently chosen to take a substance and have an experience. And so that's naturally biased towards that very large decision. So there's one bias, which is the person has taken a, a, a psychedelic drug. That's a fairly large bias. And then the second is the, the drug that they've chosen to take. So I would say that these things have to be taken circumstantially. Um, you're learning about a group of people that have decided to take that choice. And so if you're able to take it at face value, then I think it can be useful and interesting. How, how like you know, my final slide, how widely applicable it is, remains a question. Thank you. Sorry, didn't mean to be evasive there, but. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much you can say, you know, about drugs. Um, great, next question's for Rena. How have they found the tools helped them with understanding the emotive connection between consumer and brand? How much is user interpretation versus what the tool can tell you? So without getting, you know, overly complicated. We worked with Relative Insight um, and their software architects and our statisticians to apply. We've done an annual brain intimacy quantitative study for 10 years and so had a methodology that looked at, we talked about a number of archetypes that we found are the ways people uh, most connect with brands and a number of stages which measure the depth of the connection and worked with them to figure out how to translate those concepts into uh, the analysis relative insight uses and words. And so what we would get is um, basically a framework for each brand that listed their performance across the six brand intimacy archetypes we use and the three brand intimacy stages. And in addition to that, which is the traditional emblem methodology, we had this ocean of language. So we complemented that by looking at keywords and phrases and statements and tone. And so in combination, I think it really gave us a rich array. Um, you did have to wade through a lot of data that was, as you can imagine, for something like airlines, mostly complaining about delays. And so some of that you know, is, is uh, I think, more the role that Twitter plays in our communication. But in addition to that, we were able to find some uh, unique uh, uh, kind of frameworks for each brand. That answers. Yeah, that was great. And I guess we can stay with you for this one. This is for the whole panel here. Um, you touched on this a little bit with the YouTube insight, but what was the most surprising insight you found using Relative Insight? <laughs> That's a hard one to go through. Um, I'm probably going to pick the most recent thing just because <laughs> it's what I can remember more. Um, one thing I'll borrow from James, which isn't even an emblem relative insight, is you know what I thought was interesting about your report is also, um, we don't know if this behavior is increasing or not, but part of what we do is also kind of look at the collective behavioral trends that are happening, you know, whether it's cocooning from COVID or uh, the idea of needing more entertainment and binging, right, that we've all kind of need to escape our lives. And so I'm thinking about how looking at sort of the LSD mushroom piece fits into the larger kind of 
behavior of consumers today. And so that's sort of interesting for me to just think about how that is another layer of insight and mm -hmm. what it means to the mindset of people today. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Carver, over to you. Yeah, so I, I'm i thinking of another recent project. We, it wasn't even for a client necessarily. We were doing some research into the ESG space in general um, because a lot of our clients have asked about it. We've done some projects around it um, and looked at some of the consumer conversation around it or you know spaces where there's both consumer and professional. Um, what we found was surprisingly, even though you know from brands we hear a lot and our clients, a lot of interest in it, um, a lot of you know focus on it and excitement around it, um, but on the on the consumer side, not as much interest. A lot of skepticism. Um, you know, an area where often I, I think you expect, and brands you know can be very myopic. They're interested in themselves, and they think that you know the world revolves around them. And so it helps you to step back and say, well, really, like you know, it's going to take a little while before people catch up to this. You can't mm -hmm. just assume that um, because you understand the value of it and. Uh, you know, certain audiences within the company are really interested in it. Um, it's not just a universal positive play. Uh, and, and I think that really helped us kind of take a step back and reset and, and bring greater expertise to our clients when they want to talk about it and, you know, how much value it can bring to them. Yeah, great. I know ESG is a very evolving space, so we'll probably have a few more projects on that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and Adele, over to you. Last question. A um, couple things. One, in terms of rituals, like you if it's not part of your lifestyle, you don't really know about these sub-communities that are out there. You can't be everywhere. You can't be everyone. So it helped me. I'm not very sporty. Um, <laughs> it helped me um, sort of discover some uh, in incredibly interesting to me rituals about um, how people were consuming sports. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, Gen Z discoveries as well. So one thing we found out at, within the ritual study was how people were... Um, watching a game on TV, but turning down the volume to zero, turning up the volume from their radio or their radio app, and listening to the game from their local host's voice because they're so emotionally connected to that sport and to that team. They just have to hear it from someone who gets it, who gets the fandom and the city. And when I mentioned it to a colleague who's an absolute sports fan, he's like, oh yeah, that's what you do. It's like, <laughs> okay. So the power of voice uh, and, and uh, the trust in that local host voice, that was, that's something that came up in the mm -hmm. context of sports. Um, and with Jen, um, we did another study, it's completely separate with you uh, guys um, from the audio rituals one about how um, Gen Z was discovering content. And a lot of times um, conversations about radio came up in that during COVID. Um, so when we looked at how habits shifted and how Gen Z was consuming audio during COVID before and after, it verified something we had been seeing in numbers, but we couldn't quite contextualize. We were seeing an increase of interest in radio, not podcasts, not other audio, but in radio among Gen Z. And we thought maybe it's because people are living now more so with their parents during COVID lockdown stage. And from the um, relative insights research, we were able to see that there was this yearning for a, almost a nostalgia, feeling of nostalgia, but also a feeling of discovery. I discovered something that was popular or a, a main form of communication. Now I'm bringing it into my life. I'm, you know, bring, making that old thing, perceivably old, new for me. So it was really interesting to see it ex radio being picked up by um, Gen Z or this special cohort of Gen Z. Yeah. And now that COVID's you know settled back down, respectively, do you think that will stay or with the Gen Z community or? What we're seeing is that they carry it over to the other platform. So they're, again, people are a lot more mobile now. So that you're seeing the streaming app for the radio take over. They love content. You know, so content is key. The host voice is key. So whether you're hearing it on the radio device or in, over your phone, but through an app, that's what matters. Fascinating. Great. Well, I think that was all the um, questions from Zoom. So Zoom folks can hop off if they want, and we can ask the live audience here if they have any questions. There's one in the back. Here. My microphone. Okay, you got it then. Perfect. <laughs> oh, good.
I can start. Um, I think it's definitely a work in progress for us to continue to find new ways to use relative insight. I think this has been really valuable, you know, just hearing from other peers on how they use it. Um, I think for us, we've seen, we've used it in two ways. One is at the upfront of projects, um, sort of as a going really broad and seeing like as a basically a way to accelerate um, our findings um, to initial directions that we can explore further in different ways. Um, and then at the end of a project, um, to confirm you know specific hypotheses we might have come to. Um, whether that is, you know, a specific messaging platform or certain language that the client is interested in, um, which we used once um, to basically vet, you know, there's three terms they want to use, they kind of want to own a term, let's look out and see, you know, which of these terms are being most used and which ones are least used so we can direct them to the, um, to the, the term that has the most white space around it. But I will say, you know, definitely want to continue to find new ways uh, to incorporate it into our process. Adele, do you want to answer? No, I was, uh, we've done it both ways, you know, definitely to inform other research. Um, and I, th I think we've been very trans, a couple things, like we've been always very transparent about what kind of data was collected and, and what it can mean. Um, people are always impressed by the volume of conversation that's being um, analyzed. There is no way you could have done that manually in a decent way. You're going to introduce an error or bias from your analyst team in a commercial setting. I mean, a university setting, there's a way of reducing that bias, too. Uh, it would take years, and we don't have years. Um, and the other thing I'll tell you is like, I stripped off some of the numbers um, that our team sent me because I didn't need, uh, for the qualitative phase, I strictly treated it as qualitative for the, and I'm very curious how you use it actually, bringing it in, in a, into your system um, sounded more structured than the way we did it. Um, we coined it as qualitative and we told the story. People ultimately wanna hear your story and they actually have a hard time remembering all your numbers. As a researcher, we love them, you know, we're comfortable with numbers, we love our numbers, it verifies things, gives you um, that decision-making power, but there's something to be said about uncovering a thread, a cultural thread that you would have never been able to uh, begin in. Yeah, and that people people just love the story, and they if you're able to articulate that story and you say, this is an interesting way I uncovered it, they're completely fine with it. it it's... Um, it's believable to them and it fits into a context and it's an aha that you're introducing. So I never had the representativeness issue come up because we were so upfront about what was collected and what it meant. I just want to jump in and agree. Uh, so much of what the clients clients come to us for is not you know, for us to do big research data. That's not really what our agency does. Um, but it's to find new ways of looking at a challenge, new ways of looking at their product, you know, their offering, their services. Um, and so that, you know, anecdotal data, that just pure qualitative piece is really what often drives the inspiration for our work. Um, and it, you know, we can gather more of it more quickly, cut to the stuff that's more interesting more quickly. And then, you know, the quantitative part is really, it's a nice supporting piece, but it, it's not, definitely not the, the primary output of what we're trying to do. I would say for us, absent our annual study, it's one piece of a sort of early phase. I think you mentioned something similar. It didn't replace anything. It's sort of an additive layer. Um, our challenge sometimes is in the B2B space, um, we're looking at websites and social, and the material is limited, so the insights are sometimes limiting. Um, there sometimes is a lack of richness because the sites are so programmatic and and similar, right? So you really have to, and that's a finding in itself, right? And an opportunity really for the client. Um, but so in most cases in project work, it's that layer and it's usually looking at um, social and web rather than any kind of study data or customized um, content. Does that answer your question? Oh, sweet. <laughs> any other questions? Ben, you had your hand raised. Well, <laughs> that was for one question, now I've thought of another question. So I'll do the second one. So um, so some insight teams, um, if they're very sort of quant uh, background, and they present to their stakeholders, and 
the stakeholders are used to receiving the information in a kind of short way. When you start introducing text into sort of narrative, how do you find, well, first of all, is that true? Uh, are, are the stakeholders used to receiving information in a certain way? And when you introduce something like text, um, how do you do that and make it uh, easily understandable to the stakeholders? said, um, you know, different people speak differently. And then it just sparks a thought in people's minds saying, oh yeah, you know, children speak differently than adults or people from the, in the States, this is um, something that is a shared experience depending on your cultural background, urbanicity or, um, you know, where you grew up. It's, it's, it's all the way you might use and generation the way you use language will be different. And I think the minute I say that, people are like, oh, that's interesting. And I said, this is a tool that we use to reveal X, Y, Z. So uh, you know, to your answer your question completely honestly, the, the text analytics perhaps wouldn't go into an earnings call kind of statement um, where they're looking for very specific KPIs and hard numbers, but it is a very uh, useful and an additional tool that we brought in that did add it, didn't replace, but added a lot more color and rigor actually to our analyses to tell those stories. And I'd say, you know, we're not a research firm, and so um, usually I'm using these insights with uh, CMO and their team. Um, if I'm presenting something to a research department or a market research department, um, similar to what Adil said, it's usually layered. It's a part of a story, not the story in itself. And interestingly, with our shift in our annual study from a traditional quant study uh, to artificial intelligence, um, we really haven't been challenged on the methodology. I thought we might, um, because it is different. Um, but maybe it's the volume, saying 1.5 billion words and being able to explain the methodology, but in a way it gives a little more confidence in saying we spoke to 7,000 consumers around the world, so. Carver, do you have a different experience with, with like the financial industry or? Uh, you would, you might think so, but really in the end our main clients are, are marketers and, you know, they are by and large storytellers by nature, and so they do tend to gravitate more towards the story and the language than necessarily like the hard data. We've had, we have had a, key, a few clients where they were maybe more data-minded, and that's really on us, um, you know, in client services to recognize, you know, who, which audience are we talking to? You know, we've had presentations where we did say, okay, well, they are really data-focused, and we did pull out stuff that we would never have shown, I would say 90% of our clients, because they look at like a cross-tabulation chart, and they're like, what do I make, how do I make sense of this? But they actually wanted to sit on it and talk about it a lot and, and dig into it. Um, so it's nice that it's available. I would say we don't always, you know, show the sausage making in that way as, as very often. Any final questions? Yes, in the orange. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Complex answer. I mean, the ROI works for us too because we tell those stories not to just tell a story, but it's supposed to bring you new business. So, yeah. Love it. Great. Well, I'll hand it over to James to close it out. Thank you very much, very quickly. Um, just 30 seconds, just to close things up. I just want to start with some thank yous. So the first thing is, thank you very much for almost 100 of you joining um, from around the world on, on the webinar. We really appreciate that. And then a big thank you to everyone that's made the effort to come physically today. We really appreciate that. And then um, the final thank you is to Jonathan and Jess over in the wings there who've worked extremely hard to make this event happen. Thank you very much for you two. 
And then the last thing I'll leave you with is that we're going to be back with our Spotlight series in December where we're going to be talking about readying yourselves for insights in a saggy economy. Um, and then next year, um, we will have a number of Spotlight uh, series events, two of which we're going to be physically back um, in Manhattan. So we hope to see you all then. Thank you very much. Thank you.